you, you published a well-received book on uh, public diplomacy and new public diplomacy and a number yeah. of articles on the same topic in various journals. Um, I think mm. if you were to put now your, your hat uh, as a researcher uh, in public diplomacy, mm. you know, what kind of challenges do you think you know, faces a student in this kind of work? Uh, well, I think there's a students face a great deal of challenges, um, not least because public diplomacy is a very awkward concept. Now, usually we take the definitions from the United States, but the context of the United States is so different to Europe and the rest of the world that there's hardly any overlap. Um, and so, so what we're saying is that the, our concept, I mean, European concept of public <coughs> diplomacy is are slightly different. It's, it's very, very, very different. Uh, we inherited this term from the US which includes exchanges, it includes cultural work, it includes international broadcasting, it includes advocacy. Um, and as you could, could probably already sense, that's not a single concept, that's lots of concepts being lumped together into the same idea. Um, and that's led me really to the conclusion that public diplomacy isn't a concept in itself. Um, but it's more a field of inquiry or even a, a way of approaching an area that, that's, that's incredibly diverse. Okay, so if the public uh, diplomacy uh, concept is a bit uh, ambiguous, now if we add the new to the public diplomacy, yeah. we get to something even more complex. So what is new about the public diplomacy? Because there have been a number of articles talking now, not necessarily about the public diplomacy, traditional ways, but mm. something new. Uh, yeah. Is it so? Uh, I think, think there are also? probably um, three factors that are new. Um, the first is, is digital technology, so digital diplomacy, um, the impact of social media on diplomacy, and that's definitely new. It didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago. So. So that's definitely new. I think there, there are changing public expectations on government institutions. So the, the, the crisis of legitimacy that people talk about, the questions of accountability, freedom of information, transparency, that's probably the second factor. Um, and the third is, is just globalization in general, which, which has just changed how people move around the world, interdependence between countries, between uh, people, between regions. Um, so those, those three factors so together... Let me pick on the mm. third one, I mean the globalization mm. aspect. So the globalization, how do you, why do you think that this is, it adds something mm. new to it? What, it, it? In terms of intensifying the type of reaction that you expect? or what, what's, How does it change mm. the way in which you conduct public diplomacy, the fact that now globalization is getting more, more uh, intense? Well, well, usually people would, would answer that question by saying that it's, it's an intensification of, of NGOs, of mm. civil society involvement, of international organisations, so that you just generally have, uh, rather than states as, as the, the um, units of international relations, that you now have lots of different mediating actors. So diplomats end up as, as one um, body of actors who, who play a role in mediation and who represent uh, foreign policy, but there are lots of other actors too, including citizens who, who migrate much more often and have dual identities or, or several complex identities um, in ways that we like to believe didn't exist in the past. Now, I'm not sure that it, that it didn't exist in the past, but I think it, it's difficult to get away from the fact that it's intensified in recent years. I see. Now, I mean, if, if we are to, to move now to the gritty nitty part of <coughs> conducting public diplomacy, yeah. I mean, a question that I think many students would be interested in is how do you pick a theme, a topic to research? It's a vast field of study, right? I mean, yeah. well, how, how do you pick a particular topic? I think there are really two directions that, that a student should, should look at, and, and really you need to look at both at the same time. The first is on the theoretical side, where you find an interesting theoretical argument, whether it's about you know, the role of NGOs or the role of culture or, or you know, questions derived from international relations or diplomatic studies, um, theoretical questions, normative questions, um, the big questions about, about the world today. You know, from, from that side, find something interesting and then try and match it with an empirical um, set of data that you've found or that you've identified among practitioners, among diplomatic organisations, among NGOs or whoever and just try and match the, the, the contents of the empirical 
data with the theoretical question. You have, uh, speaking of which, you have an interesting project you are working right now. It's, it's a slightly historical project, but it's a quite an interesting one. So how did you pick that particular? I mean, if you want to say a few words about the project itself, I mean, it'll be good. But also, how, how did you pick that particular topic to research? Um, which, which the one with the, the history of the British Council? And yeah. Um, well at the moment, I'm working on a history of public diplomacy in Britain from um, the Blair government in 1997 to the present day. Um, and it's an incredibly complex story because, you know, as, as I said in the beginning, we in, we've inherited these terms from the United States. Um, but what we need more of is carefully contextualized, almost, you know, as Foucault talked about, archaeological studies of how terms evolve and develop and, and what they actually mean in practice. So one of the things I've found that's, that's um, perhaps been underestimated is, is not that public diplomacy in itself is an important term, but that it had importance in the development of diplomacy. Um, so what I found is that rather than public diplomacy itself being interesting, um, it's interesting as a tool of reform in diplomacy. Oh, I see. And, and, and if when you started, I mean, we, we had this conversation, I mean, a bit of a, a different part of, of this conversation, we carried that before. Um, but I think it'd be interesting also uh, to, to, um, to examine a little bit how you conduct research, because most of your research on public diplomacy and also it's important for students to understand this is based on interviews yeah and and interviews require contacts yeah which you may not have and how do you i mean it's once you you get a contact it's easier but how do you yeah. to establish you know the, the the contacts that are relevant for your research yeah. and and then how do you secure their collaboration because usually these are high ranking officials they may not have time for you, mm. especially, you know, even if you are well established in you know, a scholar, but especially for students, it is quite difficult. Yeah. So how do you deal with this kind of, of, of uh, methodological challenges? So it, it can be difficult, especially when you're starting out and especially if you're on your, your first or second project. Um, obviously, there are policy documents and it's very important to, to begin by finding everything that's in the public domain that you can. Um, secondly, there are there are the reports sometimes through the media that you can pick up. So it's very important, you know, first of all, to do the the, the archi archival research, the the document studies. Um, once you have that and you identify certain names, certain people who are involved in the reports, um, the parts of the organisation that are relevant to your study, you can then reach out to the organisation. And there are several different ways of doing that. Um, most will have a general inquiry point. Um, so you can send an email in, but I think there was a study, for example, of you know a, a big British organisation that did a study of the inquiry point, and I think about sixty percent of the the inquiries were just dropped, you know, just lost without ever oh. being answered. So you know, chances are you're not going to get an answer that way. Um, so it it really is a case of, of figuring out who do I know, who who might give me a way in. And often, I think, when you're thinking about the kinds of study that you want to do, you need to think about not just what questions am I going to answer, but also how am I going to do it? Can, can I get access to that information? Because there's no point in doing a, a study of you know, Edward Snowden and the kind of secret intelligence service if you don't have a contact sure. who can give you that information. Uh, right. And, and in terms of securing the collaboration of the interviewers, I mean, you, you meet with these people. <coughs> yeah. And the, the, the risk is always in interviews. They are going to tell you whatever they want <coughs> to tell you, yeah. right? And you may need a different type of information for your research. Yeah. So how do you deal with this? What, what, what's your strategy? Um, there's, there's, no, there's no strategy as such. What, what you have to bear in mind is that diplomats are used to giving out information. That's what they do. They, they are professional communicators. And they work in a way where they will have set lines. They, they call them press lines that they, they give for different situations. So it's almost as though they're working from a script. So they'll have certain information that they're prepared to give to the media. They'll have a second set of information that they're prepared to give to a journalist off the record. They'll have a third set that they're prepared to give to a member of the, you know, the, a foreign government in private, and they'll have, 
you know, an, an next layer that they're prepared to give to, to key stakeholders if pushed on the subject. So they're already thinking in terms of, you know, here's my level, here's what I'm prepared to, to give. So you're not going to trick them into giving you information that they don't want to give. There's, there's no possibility of, 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 of tricking them in that way. So you're not a skilled investigator trying to dig out information that they're not going to give you. What, what you need to do is, is build trust with them. Mm -hmm. um, ask sensible questions. They're, they're very good at uh, avoiding um, giving answers to questions unless you specifically ask them on the exact detail. Um, that's part of falling back on the lines as the, the scripts, as, as I just said. Um, unless you ask a specific question in a specific way, they probably won't go to that part of the script. So th think about what the information is that you want and think about what kinds of questions um, force them to, to answer in the way that you'd like them to. I see. But do, uh, do, you, do you tape record your interviews? When I was a, a PhD student, I did tape record most of them. Um, since then, I, I've, I decided not to. I do everything off the record. Um, it's working better this way. It's you, much yeah. better that okay. way. Um, obviously, you need to speak to your supervisor first and check if you're yeah. a master student or a PhD student, if it's okay to work without a tape recorder. But and also, it complies with the ethical requirements, you know. Yeah, um, of each there's university. a good trick, though, um, that I would recommend to anybody, which, which is something I picked up um, quite early on, which is if you're tape recording, or even if you're just taking notes and doing it off the record, what you can do is quite demonstrably, at the end of the interview, either turn off your tape recorder or put down your notebook and say, OK, well, I've, I've asked most of my questions now. And then you just start chatting. And what you'll find is that because you're no longer recording the information, um, sometimes these chats, the informal chat, can go on for 15, 20, 30 minutes afterwards, where people will bring up off-the-record things because they, they see that you're no longer um, jotting them down. I'd also recommend the, the walk to and from the interview as being very important steps in, in just building a relationship with someone or finding out yeah. finding out really what you know what what they're like um, are they good at small talk are they are they open or are they just doing this because they have to um, you can often find these things out within the first two or three minutes um, I also look at things like you know have they invited you for a coffee do they take you into the coffee room when you go into the coffee room you can see do people come here for lunch do they convene or is it just a single microwave where people come in? You know, do they have their own mugs or do they share? Things so, like that can give so you an idea. So how are these tips, you know, inform your interviewing yeah. approach? I well, mean, because you, for instance, yeah. a guy invites you to a coffee. Yeah. So why is that relevant for you? Because, you know, do they put money into the machine to get a coffee out or is there a coffee machine for everybody that's, that's free mm -hmm. of charge? It tells you about the environment that they work in. Is there, um, are people separate? Do they, do they, does everyone come with their own mug, take their coffee and then go back to their room? Or is it somewhere where people meet and chat and talk and, and mm -hmm. so on? So mm -hmm. it tells you something so the about the organisation. of the place, the culture yeah. of the place, right? I mean, then, might... you know, you're always dealing with a person. Um, and, you know, as you're getting the coffee, does the person ask about you, about your research? Are they interested in what you're doing? Or are they doing it because they're the representative of the organisation and they have to answer all public inquiries? And those kind of things will just give you a start in thinking about how you approach, um, how you approach your questions. Um, what you want to avoid is having a question and answer session where it's basically a series of press lines. Mm -hmm. Because you could get that from a policy document. That's, that's the kind of information that you can already get just from looking on the internet or, or reading the documents at home. What you want is information that isn't contained in those documents and, and ultimately you need to know then everything that's in those documents and already what points you want to push on to, to, to really open up um, the, the, the quality of information that you have. If I may press you a little bit more on this mm. point. So let's assume you get some interesting information from your interview. Yeah. How do you know whether that information is accurate and that you can use without compromising your research? I mean, because people may tell, not because they, mm. they, they intentionally, you know, mislead you, 
But it may happen that memo their memories, you know, they, yeah. is not accurate of what happened and they may have other agendas. And yeah. how do you test, you know, the accuracy of, of or yeah. check the accuracy of... of That's a good question. I think generally the more research you do, the more contacts you build up, so the more sources you have. Um, I, I would be uncomfortable stating something based on just one source. Okay. Um, but I, w I could still use that source to guide me in the other areas. So often what you're doing, in fact, is taking what someone said, which, which will probably form part of the hunch you have about a situation, and then you, you look for um, statements in the policy documents that could be interpreted in that way. So perhaps when you read the document the first time, you don't notice certain subtleties, but the things that people say can, can help guide you in interpreting um, what's already stated in black and white, but perhaps isn't clear. Oh, I see. So now let's, let's assume that you've completed your research and your theoretical analysis of, of the case studies, and now you have the product in hand, you know, the, yeah. the book, the article. So the last step is to publish it, right? Yeah. So how do you pick the outlet, the publication outlet? Where you do, what kind of, of, of strategy would you recommend for students? Uh, once, for instance, they have, you know, a good product, a master thesis or an mm. article ready, you know, where to send it uh, and why so? Well, for me, it was very much a, a trial and error experience because there aren't really very many outlets for, for public diplomacy scholarship. So even p perhaps now when you're thinking about the, the theoretical questions that in, inform your study, um, it's probably worth, even at that stage, beginning to think about, you know, which questions does it link in? Does it link into IR questions? Because if it does, you can approach those journals. Does it link into communication studies questions? You know, that, that opens an avenue, political science and so on. Um, the great thing about public diplomacy and, and diplomatic studies in general, I think, is that they're interdisciplinary. They draw on lots of different areas, but that can also be a weakness. And, when you're coming to publish, because often journals will, will come back and say, well, that's not really our yeah, they subject matter. The, their own standards yeah. of publication, yeah. each dis discipline has its own. So in a sense, you know, it's a challenge from... Yeah. Um, yeah. There are some, some useful places, such as the Center on Public Diplomacy at USC, the University of Southern California. They publish um, do documents from time to time, um, such as master studies or, or shorter shorter articles um, and, and give opportunities for blogging, that kind of thing. So that could be somewhere to approach. Do you blog? Um, yeah, I blog on the, the Center of Public Diplomacy website from time to time. Okay, so how yeah. do you find its experience? I mean, it's, 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 I mean, not only, you know, personally, but I think, do you think it advances, it helps with, with your career? I mean, um, I've noticed that, that blogging um, some people do blogging almost as though it's academic writing, so lots of sources, lots of, you know, basically a, a draft of, of an article that they're doing and they'll, they'll put it up on the blog. I see it more as an opportunity to write informally without too many sources, just to really say what I'm thinking out loud. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people um, have mentioned the blogs to me, and, and you see on Twitter that they'll pass around mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and be retweeted a few times. Um, I, I enjoy it. I think it's something that students should think about doing and I think that's something perhaps even as a class you could think about including um, during, during the, the, the period of your coursework because I think it's quite a healthy way to discuss things um, but you never get comments. I mean the thing about writing blogs is you know you're, you're just speaking out into infinity. It's, it's very rare to get, to get a debate or a discussion back. I mean, this kind of dual or feedback, you know, from, yeah. from the audience. Um, great, great tips, uh, James. Thank you very much. And I think uh, many students will appreciate uh, your, your, your suggestions and recommendations. And good luck with your, with your work.